Welcome to my church family. Welcome in Jesus' name. Before we start today, I'd like to share a few things that I've learned from our study of Jonah. Firstly, often when we read scripture, we are encouraged to be like those of faith who have gone before. But, as Lindsay has already said, I must admit that listening to the example of Jonah, I don't want to be anything like him. <laughs> He heard from God about what God wanted him to do and immediately ran away. He almost caused the death of people who had helped him. He called out to God when he couldn't help himself in the situation. He reluctantly went where he had been first told to go. When God decided to show mercy to the people that repented, he became angry with God, and then he finally went away and sulked. I don't want to be like that, and I pray that you don't either. As we begin our worship today, I pray our songs will reinforce some solid and centred thoughts in our hearts. God is good all the time. Even when you walk in the valley, he will keep you. Even though we don't understand his plans, he will keep us safe. Our life is in his hands. Every blessing he pours out, we should turn back to praise. Amen. Even when things are dark, he is by our side. He has promised to bring us home. And finally, whether we have peace or sorrows, whether Satan should attack us, or we are in a helpless state, may we always be able to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. <laughs> Oh, 
The Mekong River flows through most of Southeast Asia. It is a major source of life. Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam all benefit from the fertile river. Just as the Mekong River brings physical life, OM desires to see spiritual life flowing throughout the region. OM teams in these five countries are partnering under the Mekong REACH initiative, which aims to see every household within reach of the body of Christ. 240 million people live in countries through which the Mekong River flows. 70% of them are Buddhist. Over half of these people remain unreached with the good news that they are created, known and loved by God. And while the local church is established in some places, there are only a small number of evangelicals throughout the region. Large areas have no presence of Jesus' followers in them. OM is committed to making Jesus known to all. Our teams are sowing the gospel message far and wide. Local believers are being discipled to grow and live out their faith practically within their cultural context. These Jesus followers are then equipped to go out and repeat this process in places where Christ is not yet known. Just as the Mekong River carries life-giving nutrients to these lands, we need an overflow of prayer to see this work grow. 
pray with us. Pray for the people along the Mekong River to experience the true source of living water and be transformed by the love of Jesus. Yeah, I've actually been up at the Golden Triangle uh, looking across the Laos and then uh, Myanmar and all that and it is quite overwhelming to actually see uh, the conditions and the uh, way people live over there uh, and that and then come home here and it is quite an experience to have. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go and do that, I would say do it. But they definitely need God. And there is quite a few people over there on mission, uh, training up people to be able to turn around and have those people, the locals, go out and talk about God. And we're just in one part of it in Cambodia and that. But really, as much as we're in one part, we're in all. Okay. Our church has got the Mekong River on our hearts. That is our focus. But within that, the focus is Cambodia. So please keep that in mind. Please pray for those areas. That would be fantastic. And any questions you've got, come and ask. Not a problem. If I don't know the answer, Lindsay will. Well, anyhow, if we don't know the answer, we'll find that out for you. Jonah's anger at the Lord's compassion. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tar Tarshish? I knew that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, Take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a gourd and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the Lord. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the gourd so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the Lord? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been a con concerned about the board, though you did not tend to it or make it. It sprung up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city in Nineveh, in which you there were there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? and also many animals. Masterpiece. The storyline is so simple that children follow it readily. The story is marked by a high degree of literary sophistication as in any book in the Hebrew Bible. The author employs structure, humour, irony, to communicate his message with great rhetorical power. A unique book in the, in the scriptures that we've been looking at today, this uh, recently. Father, I just pause with uh, my friends here in worship today and we, we just invite your spirit to bring that hush and openness to our spirits. And if you want to say something, we pray you'll speak clearly to everyone that's 
chosen to meet here at Andrews Farm Community Church today. We thank you for our worship and for each other, for our children, our mission, and we thank you for your word. And we open it up with reverence and lean into you and express our dependence on you. In Jesus' name, amen. God does speak through his Bible. Do you believe that? It's a living word, not just an historical document. Jonah was called by God, but that same living personal God continues to call humanity and individuals like you and me. He called Jonah to Nineveh, as we've noted, a tough assignment, a violent, aggressive people. And to be obedient to the call had its cost and its risk. He called me to vocational ministry many, many years ago when I was just a young person. What call might he be expressing to you through Jonah and this word to you today? Are you open to say, God, whisper into my spirit what you want of me? And maybe even today there might be a sense in which you get an impression in your spirit, I need to go to Cambodia. God's calling me to Afghanistan and the Taliban. Or he's calling me to go to the next barbecue at Andrew's Farm Community Church and be present and just to be available to God. He called me to plant the Andrew's Farm Community Church around five years ago. And as most of you here know my story and Irma and I, we've sought to do our best. And it's not without its hurdles and its cost and its confusion, and especially now as we face an era of uncertainty about our location. And I hear God saying, like he called Jonah, you stick to your call, Lindsay, and I'm inviting you to be open today. Is God's voice calling you to something today through his word? He might have a smaller assignment or mission for you to be open to today in church here. You might need to be hearing God as you walk out these doors today and say, I've got to follow that. God's spoken to me. He might want you to move house. He might want you to join a sporting club with a, a mission heart. He might want you to commit to start meeting with a mentor and get serious about your spiritual growth. What might God be calling you to, like he was alive and personal and real and called Jonah. And you know, sometimes God calls us in the moment, like in a conversation, or you're at home or in the car and you get a prompt to ring somebody or to contact somebody or to do something specific, maybe help with a need, prepare someone a meal or mow a lawn for somebody. As we've covered today, in some ways already, Jonah disobeyed that call and went in the opposite direction. How have we disobeyed God in our lives? I invite you to reflect on that this morning as we think about Jonah. We saw how God appointed a huge storm to interrupt his escape. I wonder if any of you have stories where you just know God interrupted your direction. You were heading in a certain thing, you were, your mind was made up, but then just obstacles kept coming up and stopping you, just like happened with Jonah and the storm. And then the big fish rescued him. 
and placed him back on track. To some of you here today, I'd be surprised if there aren't some of you today with a story of a second chance where you, where you felt God's grace and you just knew that he'd forgiven you and renewed you and sent you on afresh. Sometimes in church, even um, uh, communion offers that message of grace and washing, cleansing renewing. I'm clean again. I can follow the Lord again. Sometimes I've been a Christian a long time and I know that God has rescued in Christian history and in people in congregations I've been the pastor of where he's just sent the right person along. It wasn't a big fish in the ocean, but it was the right person. And, uh, and I've known stories. I wonder if any of you could could affirm that sometimes just a, an envelope of money has turned up at just at the right time. Has that happened to anybody? I see a couple of, oh, I said, what's ahead? Isn't it great that God rescues us, provides for us, just as he did with Jonah? He's real. He's giving us second chances. So when Jonah did actually go, as we learned last week, there was an incredible fruit. Do you think those thousands of responses of the king and the, uh, and the people repenting didn't have anything to do with how good a preacher Jonah was? It wasn't. It was all about God working through his agent, through his servant. He brought them to conviction. How comforting that is, as sometimes I'm prayer walking with Roger out on the streets here, as we do, uh, and out the barbecues, and sometimes I'm thinking, oh, just Lord, I, I'm not like that Mike Hay. I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, as good as other people. How could God use me? Do any of you have that thought sometimes? And how comforting that it doesn't depend on us at all. He's just looking for our availability, our openness, our willingness to say yes. To the call, whatever that might be. So the phrases we've been using over our time has been running away from God, running to God as he did in his prayer in the big fish, running with God when he finally cooperated. But today uh, we come to this very puzzling last <coughs> chapter, which is so annoying, it's so frustrating, it's so... How could Jonah have a heart like that? He's running against God. God has heard the cry, they've repented, and the, the city is saved. And, and you know, the right response when somebody is, is uh, responded to grace and love is to celebrate. And he was so angry. Jonah, to this, Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He became angry and he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said? This is what I tried. This is why I tried to forestall fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? So this morning, I don't know your story, but there may well be, there's quite possibly attitudes in your heart today and the Lord, just like he challenged Jonah, is it right that you think that? That you feel that? That your attitude is like that here in, in our world today? He couldn't face seeing his enemy receive grace. Here we have him saying, I'd rather die. What a contrast to chapter 2 where he said, Lord, save me. He wanted to live. He was in the ocean and he was rescued by the big fish. Now, uh, his heart is so dark. And sometimes our hearts can share that darkness. He wants to die. God's love and mercy, Charles Swindle says, were far greater than Jonah's hatred. And prejudice. Hallelujah. Uh, Swindle writes in his uh, 
um, studies on this, this little prayer. Just listen to this prayer. Maybe it just sink in for us as we, as we spend some time in God's word as we're doing right now. Father, this passage comes as an indirect rebuke to all of us who live lives of selfishness and self-serving motives. Please deliver me from my agenda, my plan, my desires that cause my narrow-mindedness. There is none better to restore my life than you, God, none better to guide me my life than you, and none better to satisfy my life better than you. That's a good prayer. Lord, um, deliver me from my selfishness. There's an interesting play on words uh, in the Hebrew through Jonah. Most commentaries bring this up. It's the word manah. And it can be translated in different ways, uh, but essentially it means God arranged or God appointed, uh, God, God set up. Uh, in some, uh, one uh, scholar was saying you can interpret God ordained. God ordained or God appointed the great fish. He appointed the storm. And now in this last chapter, we see he appointed a leafy plant that grew and gave shade. Jonah was happy for a while, and then he appointed, or Manah, the worm, and he was unhappy, and then he appointed a scorching east wind. Then the Lord God provided, or ordained, or arranged. And so there's a story of sovereignty of God ordaining through, through Jonah. And uh, you might, well, that's an interesting um, uh, observation but here in church this morning my friends just reflect on your life your past and your present and your future do you believe as, as I do God is at work in your life and he's arranging and ordaining and, and moving and in the, um, in the uh, story of the Andrews Farm congregation our our burgeoning little church plant four years old now, uh, I, I believe God is still appointing. God's still arranging. I trust him and I call you to join me in trusting him. We've got to do our process. We've got to be discerning. We're trying to listen. We're trying to be obedient to the call. But I just try to get you to personalise this in church here this morning. What is God up to in your life? In terms of your circumstances and Maybe your health or maybe your finances or maybe just your work or, or God is at work in, in, in um, sovereignly. And it's a mystery. I, I can't explain it, but I believe it. There's a providential aspect of God, a mystery that he's at work in who you've married and who your children are and what is happening around you in circumstances. And I just invite you today to listen in to the sovereignty of God and like Jonah, well, no, unlike Jonah, um, be obeying what the, the providential work of God, whatever that might be. I, I can't speak into that for your life. But here we see in this short scripture, there's four chapters in the Old Testament, quite an obscure passage, an obscure book which rarely gets referred to. But there's that story of God at work from creation through Israel and still through Israel and through Jesus and the prophets and the New Testament church, which is us. And he is at work in his world. He's not left us. So I invite you today to say, Lindsay is speaking about this. What's that mean for me? Um, and, and in terms of what, what my future, as I think about my education, as I think about my, my jobs, what, where is God fitting into a call into my future? And uh, I, I've shared a little bit about mine, but I'm inviting you. Uh, you know, I, I, I really hope you can see that when you become part of this congregation and, um, and the flow of God's purpose to reach the lost in Andrew's Farm and, in, and in, including Cambodia and the, the Mekong area, that you're saying, God, how can I flow with your purposes? Not ask the question to yourself, how can this serve me? How can I be happier? But God, what are you up to in my life? And what are you doing around me as you were um, engineering uh, um, and ordaining Jonah's story? 
Jonah then is sitting outside the city, trying to make himself comfortable, still hoping that God's judgment will fall on the people. Don't you reckon that's staggering? Doesn't that sadden your heart? I believe God doesn't want us to look with to look to anybody and wish them harm and uh, and and want judgment, you know, and want the worst for them. That's what that's what we see in Jonah today. God's love is at work saving those people. They responded to Jonah's message, but he was not responding with love. What a contrast with Jesus. Can you see, even though Jesus referred to Jonah, one of the few minor prophets that the New Testament relates to and refers to the three um, being in the, in the big fish and, and a prophetic echo of the cross and the resurrection uh, on the third day, Jonah's prefiguring that, Jesus said so. We see that Jesus always obeyed the call of God, his Father. Amen? That's the story of the New Testament. That's the story of Jesus. Uh, we are to follow Christ. We're living in him. He is in us. And, and then Jesus, when he was asleep at the bottom of a boat, and you wonder of the echo of that story in, you, in the scriptures, uh, he stilled the storm instead of, instead of it being a, 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 an action to stop his running away. And then we see, instead of saying, why don't you suffer? What do we see when Jesus looks over Jerusalem? We see him weeping and loving. And just as somebody, I think it was Rosemary, that said, you know, we pray that Playford will respond like Nineveh. Do you, do you agree that we like Jesus? We weep over Playford. We hear so many stories of brokenness. And the church has a mandate to care for its community. And we are to be not like Jonah, but like Jesus. So God is rebuking Israel through this prophet's story. And he is calling us to the lost and broken like he did Jonah to the Ninevites. And when the storm came, uh, we know that that redirected him. But storms came to Israel too in the form of attacks from enemies. And the storm of exile happened to them. They didn't listen. And storms happen to us as we've been sharing over these last weeks. As I bring this series and today's message to a close, I've got a key word. I've got some words from, uh, some articles from uh, an author called Rick Warren, and uh, it's a focus on mercy. Let me just share with you some facets of mercy. Mercy means being patient with people's quirks. Do you, do you think sometimes there are people around you who've got quirks? <laughs> and uh, no pointing. And, and mercy has patience with them. Mercy means helping anyone who is hurting. Mercy means giving people a second chance. It says in Ephesians, don't be bitter and angry. Don't yell at one another or curse each other. Be kind and merciful and forgive others as God forgave you. Mercy being, means being good to those who hurt you. What a challenge. The opposite of Jonah. And he didn't want to go because they were such a cruel nation. But God's heart is reflected in Jonah and in Christ. Mercy means being kind to those who offend you. Mercy means building bridges of love to the unpopular. Mercy means valuing relationships over rules. And look at these four uh, last statements. Why should we be merciful? Because God has shown you mercy. Amen? Amen? You and I are benefits of his mercy. Because God commands us to be merciful. The Lord has told you what it is, what is good, 
what the Lord requires from you to do what is right, to love mercy and to live humbly with your God. Because you're going to need more mercy in the future. And because showing mercy does bring or lead to happiness. And a merciful heart will minister to ourselves in, a, in, a, in, a, in the opposite of holding a grudge when we forgive. Uh, I'm going to close in a moment with uh, four little uh, very helpful summary statements about Jonah's four chapters. But I do appeal to you today to be merciful to your husband, to be merciful to your wife, to be merciful to your parents, to be merciful to your children, to give undeserved mercy and grace to people who hurt you, and having been a Christian for many, many years and a minister for a long time, I've seen so many times when churches have suffered because they've not had mercy. They've had bitterness and they've had a spirit of division and legality and hostility and um, often leads to hurt and separation, breakdown of relationships. I invite us to hear from Jonah's story today to be people who give mercy. Are you hearing God calling you to be merciful today? It's his scripture, it's his word coming across to you today. Well, as I close, uh, lesson number one, any attempt to escape from the Lord is an act of futility. And we've alluded to that in our sharing and um, in my preaching. And uh, I invite you to listen to that wise word. And if God, or when God touches you and calls you and speaks to you, follow him, obey him, love him, flow with him, please. Any time and any place we call on the Lord is an acceptable time and place, even if it's in a big fish in the ocean. That was quite a place to pray out of. But wherever you might be today or in the future, the Lord, it's always a good time to cry out to him, to his mercy. Any person who's willing to deliver God's message is a messenger God is willing to use. How comforting it is for me as I see as my an inadequate person, an inadequate pastor, but, but God says, Lindsay, you just do your best and trust me. I invite you to hear that message today for yourself. And any desire we have that conflicts with God's plan requires a change in our desire. God is immutable, unchangeable, immovable. His infinite wisdom is always present. And if we're on the wrong track, guess who needs to move? And I invite you and us as a church, again, I reference the Andrews Farm congregation. Uh, we don't want to miss him. We don't want to uh, go in the wrong direction. We, we want to hear him. And I invite you to be praying with us uh, into our future as we seek just to be <coughs> present and to be obedient to our call to this, this area around Andrews Farm. Uh, we, we want to not conflict with his plan, but be in flow with his desire. So Jonah has a message for Nineveh and Assyria. He judges sin. And we mustn't forget that. That's why the cross is needed. Because <coughs> sin is real and sin offends our God. And it requires um, a response, a justification which comes, we believe, as Christians through the cross. The only way we're cleansed from sin is through Christ. A message for Israel that they kept forgetting that God is calling all nations. Uh, Israel became too inward, too uh, precious, too uh, looking after themselves. And God was saying through Amos and Hosea and uh, this indirectly through Jonah, listen, this is God's heart for all nations, including those who hate us the most. It's a message for the church that God cares about all people. And we are called to reach those around us. He also judges 
sin in us and around us. So we don't cover that over. We have to call out um, that lifestyle which is offensive of God, but promise a way of grace which is through the cross. And a message for Andrew's farm uh, that we have uh, called to share the gospel. So are we running away? Are we running with? Are we running to? Or maybe has God spoken to your heart or mind today that we're running against him? This God of the nations, this God of the seas, this God that uses storms, this God who answers prayer, this God who gives second chances, this God who sends surprises like a big fish. God is at work. Let's be open to him. Are we running from God's call on our lives? Are we running to God in repentance? Are we running with God in ministry? Or, as we've been challenged today, are we running against God in disobedience? I want to invite you just to pause. Uh, I'll get the team to come up and we'll sing our final song in a moment. But let's just pause and just search our hearts. So, Father, just as we hear your word, I just speak again into the hearts of these people who have been gracious enough to come and worship you in this church today. I thank you for bringing them. And I pray that, Lord, if there's a ringing in their ears, if there's a message for them through this strange book, this prophet, I pray that you'll open hearts today. And I ask you, Lord, to help people be open, to be ready, uh, to be committed, uh, to follow wherever you're called. And if there is a challenge there today in our hearts about our lack of mercy, that today we'll step into a deeper mercy, Father, in our homes, in our families, in our churches, in our workplaces, shining the light of Christ. Speak to your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Under the messages of Jonah, be able to actually say, it is well, with my
thank you to Pam and Tim and we continue and Craig with us today. Um, we just value Clovercrest's continued support, don't we? Amen. Amen. We really value them. Thank you so much. Our God, our Maker and Creator, hear our prayer. Where you, we have failed you, forgive us. Where we have fallen from you, restore us. Where we have strayed from you, guide us back. And where we are weak in you, strengthen us. So that forgiven and restored and guided and strengthened by you, we may proclaim your love and dwell in you forevermore. Amen.